our meeting to order for October the 16th, Board of Directors. Roll call will show all directors present except Ms. Lather and uh, Mr. Jaffe is on the telephone from Galveston, Texas. So we will have to call roll for everything on here. First thing is a public hearing, a cons consider extension of WDO sunset period for a single family residential development. Yes, good evening, <coughs> uh, directors, as well as uh, um, Gary Rawlinson is here in the audience. He's the applicant. Mm -hmm. He came before you uh, in September and asked uh, to be agendized. He has, he owns a lot that is in uh, Aptos and Seascape where it was previously approved. Uh, the memo states that it was back in 19, 64 that this lot was created as part of the country club park track uh, subdivision and so um, we confirm i just i'm giving you that background to confirm that this lot does qualify for an exemption from the water demand offset program that the board made that action back in 2016 and gave those lots a three-year period to gain a building permit now in, in this case, the applicant did not uh, find out about that three-year period right away. Um, and so he did begin his building permit process when he um, found out about it. And it, it's, it's, he's in a point where he's in the coastal zone, and I'll let him speak as well. But uh, he's requesting an additional three months to complete the process beyond January 5th next year. So that is what is brought to the board. Um, and I have not dealt with other lots. There's one other lot that you're familiar with, maybe that was the same evening in 2016 up on De Bernardo Lane that initiated this, this concept. So um, I recommend we open the public hearing, take testimony, and then carry on through the night. Good. All right, let's open the public hearing. Anyone wish to address us on this item? This is the time. Hello. Hi. Hi, how are you doing? Thank Good. you. <clears throat> Would you like me just to cover a couple things here? Uh, Anything you want, it's your time. Okay. Uh, first of all, I don't own the property personally. My parents own the property. And uh, so I'm acting on their behalf. I actually operate under a durable power of attorney uh, in all matters. Uh, so I, don't, I wouldn't normally get any notice anyway. And I don't know if they did get any notice. I was told that generally it wasn't uh, something that was sent out as far as a notice. But once I found out, I immediately started to uh, begin the design process. Problems I'm running ran into immediately is that uh, for the most part, professionals are very busy. They're very swamped in this town. Uh, and of course, uh, I was soon into the holiday season as well. So we had a couple of different things working against me. Uh, I did manage to get the uh, design that I created to engineers uh, before Christmas. Was told that it would be uh, sometime in January that they would have plans and, and be ready to proceed. Uh, the civil engineer actually delayed about three months on that, and that's one of the major things that put me back. Uh, I actually had to pull the uh, project from, they were also going to do structural. I pulled the uh, structural from them and then went and found another engineer to complete that. Now I was able to finally submit in June. Uh, I'm not a professional designer, architect, or any of these things. So as you might imagine, there were a number of corrections. It turns out uh, the uh, packet of corrections comes to 52 items just from the plan check uh, uh, item there, or the plan check uh, personnel. Also some stormwater and transportation as well. Uh, I have been working with <coughs> a consultant in the last few weeks to try and address these. And I hope to resubmit within the next week or so. Um, I'm doing this as, as, as fast as possible. Uh, but I expect that there's, a, I've been told, that it's very unlikely that even on a second submission that I'll be successful, that they'll bring me back for more corrections after that. And that to get that done before the deadline is highly unlikely. Uh, with how swamped they still are down there, um, and also the particular reviewer that I have, uh, have my uh, project under um, has declined to personally meet with me in anything more than a fairly insignificant number of matters. Uh, he's, he's swamped, that's 
part of the reason. And each reviewer down there has their own style. So I have been able to meet with some staff members down there, but I'm working with, uh, with them as best I can. Okay. Okay. Uh, if it's possible, give more than three months, that would completely take this off an issue. Mm -hmm. I have no idea how many times I'll have to go back. Any questions of the applicant? No, I read the. Yeah. No, I did too. Mr. Jaffe, any questions? No, I don't have any questions now. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. That's mm -hmm. it. Okay. Thank you very much. Yep. Anyone else in the audience wish to address us on this item? Nope. Seeing none, I'll move we close the public hearing. I'll second it. We have a motion second. Roll call, please. Director LeHue? Yes. Director Christensen? Uh, yes. Director Jaffe? Yes. And President Daniels? Yes. Okay, so it's back to the board. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Does staff have any position on this uh, item? He thinks we're done. Gary? Wait. That was just to close the public hearing. <laughs> <laughs> just the close of the public hearing. So go ahead and have a seat and listen up. We're not. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering myself. <laughs> Does staff have a position on this item? Pro, con, no, no opinion? I, you know, I think one might ask why, why couldn't we notify everybody um, about this and we just have so many other priorities this is not on our list it was up to um, people building to come to us and mm -hmm. and to prove that that they basically qualified for this exemption or this uh, sunset period um, you know I can understand his situation he is in the coastal zone and mm -hmm. and it is a busy time we know that for sure right. um, if you know, if, if you need to meet somewhere in the middle, we have a proposal for that, but, um, you know, I think you would, you'd have to think about the other lots that, that may be in a similar situation, although that time frame is, is narrowing down. So one option is, is you could, you know, p potentially direct staff to come back and, and modify that original um, idea of January 5th being the sunset and, and extending that to everybody another three months if you don't, didn't want to grant him a special privilege. Uh, you know, I think if, 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 the, uh, the, if the decision is to not grant the variance, then we would um, potentially and and him and suggest that this lot be subject to the water demand offset program then we would recommend that that be um, <coughs> that he be considered as the one of the older uh, types that would would pay the original fee right. and not be put on the waiting list since he's so far ahead right okay those are the two options you mm -hmm. I would recommend considering yeah, that's exactly what I was going to ask. What would be the repercussions that we didn't gra gr didn't grant the three month extension? And if you didn't, uh, then you know, then the water demand offset program. Well, if assuming he doesn't get through and get a building permit in b before January fifth, then after that point, the water demand offset water demand offset program would apply, mm -hmm. and and then we have two different tracks there for the water man offset program. There's the new track, where's the waiting list and the rebate toilets. And then there's the kind of the grandfathered people that have already been in the process. And I think he would fall into that process if, if you do go that route. And uh, how many more, do, you, do we have a tally now of how many more lots there are that were affected by the sunset clause? You know, I don't, I don't know of any right now that are in the, in the uh, pipeline. Um, so I don't know if Shelly, if we would have. I don't think there's more than a couple, if, if any. Um, it, because it, the situation is that these lots are out there and we don't, we don't, didn't notify them because that would involve a lot of research going through county maps to find all of the subdivisions that were approved at one time with lots that have not been built. And I know a lot of the it's records were destroyed. Yeah, um, I, 
I really can't think of one off the top of my head that's in the process right now. Um, we did have some come through that did get building permits, and so they met the exemption. Um, you know, if, if any came up, it, it would be less than two, I would imagine. Well, if they haven't really already initiated contact with us, there's no way they're going to finish by January. Mm -hmm. So, or, or April by that. Yeah, or April, April right. April. So, yeah. you know, I, I think there's a very small exposure here or, num you know, the Me Too clauses here. I think our exposure is really limited, and I, mm -hmm. I personally think, you know, he's done his due diligence, and I'm, I'm actually okay with the three month variance. And I am too, as long as there are not 50, 50 lots out there. No, there's no, no there's way. not. And it, because it would just create a, you know, big a precedence, yeah. I'll, I'll even make so that motion okay. to grant the variance. And I will second it. All right, we have a motion and a second. Roll call, please. Director LaHue? Yes. Director Christensen? Yes. Director Jaffe? Yes. And President Daniels? Yes. Now you can leave. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. Let's see. What's next? Uh, consent Through, agenda. Consent uh, agenda. So anything that you wish to have taken off of consent? I don't. Mr. Jaffe? Public? Uh, no. No consent okay. agenda. I just had a, another question about the 3.5, I guess. Um, okay, you want to pull 3.5? 3.5. Let's, let's pull it, 3. 5, let's let's pull it pull down. down. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so all we're asking is if anybody had any, any in the public had any um, items they wanted to remove from consent. That was all. You have to you can pull you have off. to comment on something that's pulled so if you want to pull something so just which which one do you want pulled um i'd like to pull item 3.3 3. okay great so okay. that's fine so i'll i'll make the motion to approve 3.1 3.2 and 3.4 second okay roll call please Director LeHue? Yes. Director Christensen? Yes. Director Jaffe? Yes. President Daniels? Yes. Okay, we're gonna hear 3.3, .3, September warrants, August, September credit card analysis. Thank you, Becky Steinbrunner. I always um, am interested in looking through these because um, it shows a lot where the money is going. And so um, I totaled up all of the items um, for Pure Water SoCal project. And for September alone, it comes to $334,667. That includes the $100,000 general manager authorized um, purchase order approval. So I just, uh, wanted to point out that that's a considerable amount of money f uh, being spent on a project that hasn't been a formally adopted by your board. Um, I also have wanted to ask a question, and this is the question that I have. Um, the $14,306.65 payment to Carollo Engineer, technical support for development of enhanced source control study. What is that? And I also had a question about um, uh, the number of overcharges that I see being refunded. I haven't in the past seen that many. If you can enlighten me on to why you think that happened, I would appreciate that information. I. Um, there are several refund of excess deposits for, for several items. And um, the um, legal settlements at the end, there's a big long string of those, and I would appreciate explanation of those 
payments, please. Um, and one more, the final one is um, consulting services for SoCal Creek Weir project to Craigerbrook Brook for a little over $2,000. What is that? Thank you. I think for a lot of those, you'll have to go to staff. Um, I can tell you what the, uh, the issue is about uh, source control. Um, having been on the regional board, we do that a lot. Uh, when you have a septic system, <coughs> you go out and look at everyone who puts stuff into the septic system. And in some cases, like hospitals, they're required to treat before they put it into the sewer system. And that's called source control. So clearly, that's something that matters to us, too. And the weir project is a removal of a weir on Soco Creek that is no longer functional and for fish passage that needs to be removed. Yeah. The others you'll have to ask staff. Yep. Okay, so we're done with 3-3. Three, three. We'll make the motion. Wait, do we have to approve that? No, we don't approve that. That's just for information. Right. Okay, 3-5, deny claim of damage. Douglas. That's uh, Director Christians. Oh, yeah. I, well, I just, uh, I, you know, he was making the complaint based on not being notified officially about a leak that happened on a timely basis. And so I was just wondering, and I, that's in my neighborhood actually, so that's, I know th those people, and they are not residents at all, and they're not there regularly. So I was wondering if it was legal, legal to offer a, s a notification service on that, because I know we can't, you know, we are we can't tie staff up t on a routine basis to do that. But I'm just wondering if any other water districts had considered Director uh, Christian a notif notification system. Yeah. Because this matter is being referred to the JPIA because of the value amount of it, mm -hmm. it's probably not a good thing to sit here and talk about issues which could or may not affect liability. Okay. Generally, on ones that are being referred. Mm -hmm. The procedure is denial, and then they take take over. Okay. Well, as I'm to fine a, with as that. To an individual. I don't need to know the answer to that particular thing. It's more of a right. general question right. that should have triggered that. Yeah. Uh, and we do notify customers when they have a leak. Mm -hmm. um, we send them a leak notification door hanger, and we let them know that they may have a leak. Mm -hmm. The only way we know is we're out at the premises, we're checking the meter, and we see the meter moving continuously mm -hmm. and they get a leak alert on the AMR meters and so mm -hmm. they'll identify how much of a leak they think it, it might be might be exposed to and then they hang a door hanger on the customer's door. Now they come back to the office and if that uh, customer account has a separate billing address uh, as opposed to a service address then a leak notification is also sent to the billing address along with die tags okay. and, and all of that was done. Oh, okay. I was just curious in general if there was a way. Is I know if we implement the AMI service that a lot of these kind of issues would be uh, ameliorated, but I was just wondering if there was anything in place now. Yeah, we, we do notify. Mm -hmm. so we just don't shut off the service unless it's a significant leak. And that's to protect not only the customer but the district as well. But that was my only question, just a general one about Sure. Because there's an awful lot of uh, vacation homes in mm -hmm. water district. So. Okay. Well, I'll move that we deny the claim and refer it to JPIA. I second, but I have a question. Okay. So oh. If we had AMI, would this have been detected earlier? Yes. It would have been detected um, within, you know, 12 hours of, of the leak happening. Um, and a notification would have been made to the customer um, by phone. Um, but if the customer is traveling out of the country, you know, you're not likely to be able to reach them. So mm -hmm. uh, we have a, a 30 gallon per hour threshold for shutoffs, and uh, that seems to be a a good level in terms of staff resources and if we were to consider lowering that it, it would really impact our staffing so we don't necessarily okay. have the phone number for every client do we we try to have the phone number we try to have everybody's email but things change and people don't always notify us and so that can also be a problem mm -hmm. All right. yeah 
And but if if uh, we had the software that goes with the AMI that people can uh, like the app, an app they could get the notice no matter where they are as long as they had correct uh, internet if, connection. If they signed up for the customer portal notification, okay. they would be getting that through their phones or their computers. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we have a motion and a second. Roll call. Director LaHue? Yes. Director Christensen? Yes. Director Jaffe? Yes. President Daniels? Yes. All right, oral communication. Items not on tonight's agenda. You have three minutes to talk about anything else. My name is Tom Stumbaugh. I live in Aptos, right pair. I'm uh, perplexed by the way leadership in this district cling so tenaciously to the so very costly idea of pumping sewage water into our aquifers when I have heard and learned there is plenty of water available from other sources at what? Approximately one-tenth the cost. And like the water people in the city of Santa Cruz, I am wondering why you are not jumping at the chance to accept all the perfectly good drinking water they are offering and which is available now, whereas your water, the sewage water, won't be available for five years yet, as I understand it. I sh also, I would like to know why those who live in multifamily dwellings pay only about half of what I pay for water living in a one-family dwelling. They are all use as much water as I do and most of them use much more. I would like to hear your reasoning for these circumstances here and now or read about it in the immediate future. Thank you. Thank you. Any feedback? Uh, yeah, I, I have something. Thank you for your concern about the, the water for the future. I'm very concerned as well to keep seawater infusion from coming farther on land. And I and I believe the rest of the directors are very receptive to taking uh, water from Santa Cruz and any other sources. And uh, as a matter of fact, we have a pilot study that's going on and we're going to take as much water as Santa Cruz is willing to offer. And I also am receptive to uh, all sources of water, anything that will raise the water level so we can push the seawater offshore more and protect the aquifer. I'm very, very uh, receptive to. And in terms of the cost, um, I think uh, the numbers are different than, the, than you have uh, stated. And that's something that uh, I'm sure that if you go back through minutes, you'll be able to tell, you'll be able to see if, in fact, Santa Cruz was willing to give us more water, that their costs would be quite a bit more than what you're talking about. But thank you for thank you for, for bringing this up because it's we're we're all in this together, and uh, we're all trying to protect the aquifer. Thank you. Uh, would you be would you be uh, aware of when uh, the district will begin to take water from the city of Santa Cruz from but other sources? We could say November. potentially the end of November, like a, m a month and a half from now. You're going to begin. To Hopefully, if all goes well with our testing of the you know, of the pipes that were isolating and be getting ready for it, yeah. So how is this going to affect 
the thing with the sewer water on which you're spending so very much money? Well, this water from the city is only one-fifth of what we need, and it only lasts for the next two years. And then it goes poof. And then there'll be a different price, I'm sure, and there will be, um, so we, we have to make sure we've got lots of options because we don't know how that one's going to work out. Well, everything uh, that I have heard is that there's all kinds of water available. Well, I you know, you, you do hear that, yeah. and, and the only place we can get it from is the city of Santa Cruz, so we get our information about what's actually available from the city of Santa Cruz. Everything else is speculation. Right. Because that's the only true. place they have to give it to us. How much water is running into the ocean every day through that river? Okay, so I think your three minutes are probably up. They are. Okay, I next. Start talking, I can't charge in mm -hmm. that time. Um, my name is Scott McGilvery. I live in Live Oak. Um, I'm one of the... Uh, early members of Water for Santa Cruz County. I haven't been here for quite a while because most of the efforts that we've been putting in and that I've been putting in have been directed at Santa Cruz, mm -hmm. which has the water, which needs to let go of the water so that you can get the water. Uh, I'm here particularly tonight because of a note that Ron Duncan sent to Rick Longinati that announced that uh, the uh, gathering of 30 days of data would begin not later than October 22nd and that water could flow before the end of November, by the end of November, mm -hmm. and that a permit had been applied for to the state on the 14th of September, and we hadn't heard anything back, and I'm, I'm here to celebrate that. Uh, Good. I think I um, appreciate Bruce Daniels' smile, as I recall the story. Mm -hmm. This is your 16th year in this endeavor, and we may be within 45 days or 30 days of seeing water flow, mm -hmm. a new experience. Right. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but what I'm, uh, why I'm here is I don't think you're aware of what's been going on with Santa Cruz and water for Santa Cruz. Um, we have been studying the amount of water that's available in Santa Cruz, and uh, it continues to grow. The volume continues to grow. I want to share a little bit about it because I think you really, you need to know this. Um, I wrote Melanie and asked her if she knew if 450 million gallons of water was available. She didn't even bother to answer back. So I'm here to give you some of this information. I've given it to Rosemary Menard and John Ricker in the form of a letter. I've talked with Rosemary Menard over the phone. She didn't have any problem with the facts, which is good because they're just Santa Cruz Water Department numbers. So uh, here, here are some, some of the facts. Um, we presented how much water could have been sent in 2017, which was a whole lot of water, and Rosemary didn't like that because that was a very wet year. So we went back and we did a very dry year, which was this year. We still found 800 million gallons that Santa Cruz had in its possession that went out to sea because there was no place to put it. Mm -hmm. uh, we did another version, which was an average year, which was 2016. 2016 was an average year. And what we found is there's 435 million gallons that Santa Cruz has that if they had a place to put it, they could store it. After we did that, um, we looked at another circumstance, which is that Santa Cruz takes water from this aquifer, takes water from the Belts Wells, 140 million gallons a year. If Santa Cruz stopped taking that water, that water would be in the aquifer. That's up to, uh, I'm going to hit the buzzer here. I hope I get another minute. I don't need much more time. I'm going to hit it in six seconds. Um, so that gets us to 560 million gallons a year. Uh, in addition, Santa Cruz has announced that they're going to file for a change in place of use for the San Lorenzo River water. And if that is the case, and Rosemary says it is the case, that puts into play another 500 million gallons. So the amount of water that's available to come to this aquifer now with the infrastructure limitations we have is a whole lot more water than anybody thinks. It is right. not 20% mm -hmm. of the demand, which is 200 million gallons. Right. Time's up, I'm afraid. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, 
Okay. This is this is fine. This is fine. We'll have a continuing conversation. And uh, yeah, I'm glad you're communicating you. with yep. Sammy. Next. Well, I'd like to comment on that as well. Okay, go ahead. Scott, thank you for all the work you're doing. And as I have told you personally, and I've stated publicly, very receptive to having water from Santa Cruz. Uh, one question that I have on this is whether your analysis includes uh, climate change and droughts in the future. And I'd like to see that. And also I'm receptive to meeting with anyone from Santa Cruz or from other places who have a, uh, a way to get more water in the aquifer because that protects the aquifer and keeps seawater offshore. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll be in touch, but thank you very much. Mm -hmm. I'm Jimmy Cazar, I'm a rate player, uh, payer. Can I waive my three minutes to some? No, we don't let that happen, unfortunately. We don't do Can't that. do that? No, we don't do that. Yeah, some do. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, I wanted to hear more of what he was saying because mm -hmm. it was very fascinating. There will be other opportunities for right. sure. I do want to say that I'm in the community a lot talking to people all over the place. They're not in favor of this sewage treatment thing. They don't even know how much their rates are going to go up once that thing gets spent and in mm -hmm. operation. They're not happy. I can't find anybody that's on board mm -hmm. except in here. Okay. So that's all I have to say. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Becky Steinbrenner, resident of Aptos. Scott, thank you for bringing some good factual information that you always get from uh, dependable sources that are uh, available to the public. Um, I would like to second what he said. I would like to draw to your attention, I'm sure you saw the excellent article in last Sunday's Santa Cruz Sentinel on the front page talking about this very thing. And so to that end, I um, am a little concerned when I went to a water Santa Cruz City Water Advisory Commission meeting and saw that there are zero stakeholders engaged, actually engaged in the water transfer process in attending the, um, the district's public outreach, and I'm just gonna call it the Supplemental Supply Committee because it's easier to say. Um, I learned that um, things are not in place or have not been put in place in a very timely manner to do some of, fulfill some of the requirements, uh, most notably the four-week testing pro of the service area that will receive the service water. Uh, that hasn't even been started, and to my understanding, as of last week at this committee hearing, committee meeting, um, the state had not gotten back to the district about those plans that had been submitted. And um, uh, the other requirement is that um, in the public outreach, they really hadn't discussed, and uh, it didn't seem like anyone really had a plan for how the um, customers within the service area that would will will receive this surface water would be notified, and that's another one of the requirements. So here we are, the, the agreement was to begin taking water November 1st. You got the results of the pipe uh, study that was very favorable, and yet nothing happened all summer toward this end. Lots happened for Pure Water SoCal, and that's, my, that's what I'm upset about. Um, I also want to draw to your attention some in campaign <laughs> information that the three uh, board members who are up for re-election put out with the slogan, Solutions Grounded in Science, not, all in capitals, ones that won't hold water. The um, other people running, other person running, is talking about water transfer. And so I have to assume, and as many of the people who receive this assume, is that uh, there's a real distrust by those who are on the board now of the validity of a water transfer. And that bothers me a lot, that it's being dismissed by the board members um, out in the community. So to that end, I have organized, along with the Sierra Club and Women's International League of Peace and Freedom, a candidate forum for 
um, SoCal Creek Water District Board candidates, and that's going to be next Monday night, October 22nd, 6 to 8 p.m. at the Aptos Library. It'll be moderated, and um, the candidates will receive Thumbs prepared up. questions in advance. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I'll be happy to address that since that is was my campaign mailer. Uh, and also point out that our mailer does specifically mention the community water plan, which does uh, mention the water transfer program in that document. And further, uh, we all read the Santa Cruz Sentinel in that article, and we are very happy. It is really always very reassuring when you're trying to make long-range planning for something as uh, dire as water to stave off saltwater intrusion to have two alternatives that are possible and n neither one would happen unless we pushed, we all pushed forward on all possible avenues of actualization of these two projects. So uh, far from disrespecting the actual process that we're undergoing uh, for this with Santa Cruz City, we are cooperating everywhere we can and contributing to scientific studies to make sure that it's safe. And I'm sure you're all aware too that the intertie has been in place for a while and there have been exchanges back and forth. The intertie are always available for exchanges on an emergency basis. So this, it's, this is a new use for it, but we have been doing water exchanges. Um, I'm just curious what the one thing Let's not get into dialogue. I can't let's dialogue not get into you, dialogue. But after the meeting, and let's, fine. And let's also stay away from politics, if you don't mind. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Hi, Gary Lindstrom from Aptos. Um, I just want to repeat what the uh, previous three people said, and I'd like to add that yes, uh, the um, transfer program has been tested for drought years, and it works out very well. We've even had the state look at the, the state fish and wildlife have looked at it. There's no problem with the fisheries and all that. So yes, it has been studied in a drought year. transfer program of water also sounds like a, uh, a very good idea and the pure poop water injected into the aquifer is pretty horrifying to me. There's no way you can remove pharmaceuticals and other chemicals. I'm, I'm thinking of how we have been assured many times of the safety of different projects and to remind you that when, for instance, nuclear power plants first came out, we assured they were safe, clean, and cheap, and they're anything but. Look at Fukushima, you know, Three Mile Island disaster, and the fact that one out of two men will develop cancer in their lifetime, and one out of three women, radiation causes cancer. I'm also thinking of when I was a child in Los Angeles, and I was born in 42. We go into the shoe stores, and there were these machines, and you would stand in the machine, put your feet there, and you could see the bones of your feet in the shoe, supposedly to show you that the shoe fit. They did remove those machines because the radiation was dangerous and spreading to the reproductive organs. It was, you could really see it, it was really exciting, but dangerous. So we have to ask, and also smoking and asbestos were considered safe. Things take time to develop. I want to, so um, I'm very uh, skeptical when we're told things are safe and the evidence actually shows otherwise. The AMI, AIM or AMI meters um, 
emit microwave radiation, and they're not green, they're not safe, and I'm going to distribute this again, and anybody who's watching, this is put out by Stop Smart Meters, and it says smart meters costing you money, risking your health, privacy, and safety. These emit microwave radiation and dirty electricity. They can catch fire, explode. Some of them caught fire, fire in Capitol in 2015. So again, I submit this. Thank you. Actually, that's attached to the minutes of the last meeting if you want to just keep that. Okay. It's already, we already have that. It's you part of the it? minutes. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'd like to co make a co two comments. Okay, go or ahead. The last, the last speaker. I, Sorry. Is my time up? <laughs> uh, the, last, the, the last speaker. I, I too am skeptical uh, of, of information that comes. And uh, so my approach is to do the research and, and see whether or not I agree with, with the, the facts that are or what is being presented. So I just want to say that. And then to the previous speaker, uh, in terms of uh, a drought plan and water transfers, I'd like to know who you've been speaking with at the, uh, was it Fish and Wildlife? I forget what it was, but yeah. I'd like to get that information and talk with them as well. And I haven't seen the plan, and, and I'm assuming that the assumption that is in this plan is, is for a certain amount of water coming from Santa Cruz, and I'd like to see those assumptions as well, because as of now, the only thing that is being offered is two years of pilot study. Thank you. Okay. It? Oh, yes. No, it's okay. okay. Is there anybody else? Anyone else? Mr. Tursus? Seeing none, I'll bring that back to the board. And I'll, I'll just add, you know, it's just, we've all gone through our, our own skepticism about anything we're considering, including using purified water from, from wastewater. And so we've, we've done a fair amount of research and feel, I feel, after all of that, comfortable about the safety. So I wouldn't be here and trying to see if that's a valid option my whole goal is to prevent the ruining of our groundwater basin so we'll keep considering it and, but I you know just so you know I'm, I'm sure all of us have we want it to be safe as well all right Should well I, I have that? a couple of things I wanted to add to that um, along the same lines for those of you who are concerned about this term poop water or whatever you want to call it if you want if you don't want poop water, you should not drink the water that comes from Santa Cruz. They've done a study of some of the constituents, and some of them are pharmaceuticals in, in the water, and uh, their water is worse quality than our groundwater, and our groundwater is worse quality than you get out of a purification plant. And there's one right over the hill in um, Silicon Valley. There's one going in in Monterey, and the biggest one and best one is Orange County. They've been doing it for over 30 years, uh, they're doing 100 million gallons a day of uh, recycled water. They intend to go to 130 million gallons. So, and they have a great record. Everything, er, all the constituents are below one part per trillion, which is basically essentially non-existent. You hardly can even test down any lower than that. So the purest water you can ever get right now is gonna be from purified water. In fact, I think the city should put in purification for their river water. In fact, when we had someone from, I think, the federal EPA come and talk, uh, he mentioned that, that you know, it would be good if the city got a purification plant for their river water. So if you're concerned about that. Also about this, you know, getting water from the city, I've told Becky, I've told other people that if we get offered more water from the city at the same terms, I would go for it. But we haven't. All we have offered right now, of course that could change, but it might not change. They might decide 
they want to keep it all for themselves or they want, might want to sell it to somebody or I don't know what. But right now, the only thing that they have offered us is the 300, up to 300 acre feet. In the drought years, we might not get anything. But up to 300 acre feet at a price of about $300 an acre foot, which is double the cost it takes for us to get it out of the ground. So already we're paying more for that water, but how much might they give us? What time of year might they give it to us? What, the, what are they gonna charge us for us? It's all speculation right now. And so until we get something a little more concrete than nothing, um, we can't do anything else. We can't sit around and wait and wait and wait and wait for Santa Cruz. I've been told by them that they're not even gonna make a decision till the end of 2020 as to whether they're doing you know, pu uh, transfer water or if they're doing their own purification plant or if they're doing their own desal plant or what. So until they make their d minds up and actually offer us something, we don't have anything to do. So my comments. Okay, so let's move on. Let's move on. Item 5.1, the board planning calendar. Yes, I'll point out a couple items. Um, the Finance and Administrative Service Standing Committee is next Monday, 4 to 5. That's Director Christensen and Director Daniels. Um, then also next Wednesday, October 24th from 5 to 8.30 is the GSP Advisory Committee uh, meeting. And I have some notes on what went what we did at the last meeting. But also on the following Monday, October 29th, is the Water Rates Advisory Committee. Um, and just wanna make sure everybody's aware that at the next board meeting <laughs> on November 6th, it'll be starting at 5 p.m. It'll be at the Community Foundation and that'll involve a water demand offset workshop that the board asked for. So. I know it's on the calendar. I just want to highlight 5 p.m. Community Foundation. Um, that's all I have for that. Any comments? Board? Public? I have one on the meeting. So I've already mentioned that I'm going to be in the East Coast for the for the Mid-County Groundwater Agency meeting. And right. Card is my alternate. But I, mm -hmm. on, I don't, it'll extend into that meeting on the 20th, so I'll still be back there. So I could potentially conference call in, but I don't have an address at the moment. Okay. okay. All right, we'll just be in touch on that. Thank yeah. You. Mm -hmm. November 20th. It, is it too late to uh, make a comment on the uh, things not on the agenda? Things not on the agenda? Oh, okay, go ahead. I just uh, have been talking with a lot of customers, and one thing I'd like to see uh, Jen dies, doesn't have to be right away, is just uh, about the chlorination process for our water and how that's monitored as it moves through our, our water system. Okay. Because there have been some comments about high chlorine levels in certain parts of the district. Okay. We can talk about that. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Sure. 5.2, special board assignments. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'll just note that uh, Director Christensen brought up uh, a request at the October 2nd meeting and that's been put on there and that's uh, to agendize the, uh, are there any modifications we might make um, as an organization to uh, make the board meetings more efficient but also staff's input to try to um, optimize our time. And so Tracy's taking the lead on that. Um, we're researching what others have been doing and collecting some information. So we envision bringing back a memo uh, at an upcoming meeting that kind of is workshopping in the sense of not necessarily hitting a resolution maybe at that meeting, but soliciting more input and then coming back for a final. So I just wanted to make you aware of that. Any comments, staff, public, on board? On which? Hmm? The one we're just doing. The Special board assignments. Five point two. Report. Okay, but that so all of the the whole thing are just the, just the administration. Part. Five point two. Okay, so I just wanted to be thank staff for reaching out to the new golf course owners for the for the stormwater recharge thing. So I realize I don't think the sales gone all the way through yet, but um, I'm glad they're receptive and thanks for following up. 
5.3, quarterly organization-wide sta abbreviated status update. Yeah, and let, let me, before Shelly kicks off, one of the things we thought we'd dip our toe into regarding uh, the optimization and, and timing uh, is this report itself, uh, it's, it's evolved over time, and one of the things we've done is um, uh, a couple, four times a year, I believe, we elaborate on each manager does a more um, bigger picture view of what, what they're doing, and then in the other uh, months, it's more concise. This is typically the month that we would, everybody would have a very elaborate, long uh, report, and as managers, we got together and said, you know, sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't. So what you see here is kind of some, some managers chose to do a shorter, shorter version, some decided to do uh, more in depth, it helps them. So if that works for the board, we'll probably continue this process in the future, meaning uh, on the organizational-wide quarterly reports that are um, more comprehensive give the, the right to the manager whether to expand out more or not. And if the board finds that valuable, it, it'll help staff, so. Yeah, so the board can ask questions. If yeah, anything. yeah. Okay. So with that, um, All right. we'll jump into it. Thank Conservation. You. Okay, um, Ron mentioned that we're having the board workshop on the WDO program prior to the November 6th board meeting. And I just wanted to add that we will be reaching out to the applicants that are on the wait list to purchase offsets to let them know about the workshop in the event that they want to attend and um, gain that information or provide input. So that was all. Do you have any questions on the rest of the report? No. Yeah, I, I, maybe I have a little primer on, on making sure I understand the numbers on the chart of the WDO program status. So just how all those numbers add up because on the current program? Yeah, so for the current program, there's 46 projects on the wait list that take a maximum of about 37 acre feet of water. Um, we have applicants under the old program that um, have added to the actual shortfall or are expected to add to it once they get a building permit and come in and purchase their offsets. Um, the total offset shortfall is uh, 34, wait, I'm sorry here, total offset That's what I was trying shortfall. to figure out the numbers. Yeah, um, the actual shortfall is almost six acre feet and the shortfall on paper is 34 acre feet. So um, the, the plan is to work with the um, people on the wait list and uh, get them through um, a new offset program, uh, allow them to purchase credits first, have first dibs basically once we roll out an offset bank. Okay. Thank you. So, okay. Um, what's up? Anything else? Uh, I guess not. All right. So, what's next? Engineering, I think. Okay. Engineering. Um, well, I was one of the managers that decided to give you a comprehensive report. <laughs> so I noticed. Sorry about that. Um, Doesn't hurt. I will highlight that the inner tie between service area three and four at the end of Sumner, the pipeline is installed and we're filling it tomorrow. And so the pressure test and back T testing will be this week. And the, the pressure regulating vault has also been set. If you've been driving around, you can see that big box. It's going to reduce the pressure from sub area three to sub area four. Um, a very uh, smooth project so far. Good. I don't want to jinx it, but it's going well. Uh, probably just a few weeks left, and then uh, we are also coordinating with PG&E, but they're probably going to hold us up a little. Um, also on tonight's agenda, there you'll see the item for the Granite Way well. We are, we kind of separated that project out just because of the fact that we only got one bid last time. Um, but tonight we're asking the board to um, award a uh, contract to put in the pumping equipment. And then we'll return also um, over the next month or so to uh, acquire some of the electrical panels and then also uh, bring back a smaller contract to do all the rest of the stuff. 
Um, hopefully we'll get started uh, on that project, you know, and finished sometime after the new year. Um, a lot of discussion tonight about surface water. Um, I'll also cover Christine's uh, O&M report tonight, so they sort of cross over since we're working together on that. The, uh, the zone for the test pilot, the first phase one pilot area has been isolated and, you know, one of the comments tonight was why not sooner? Well, if you, if mm -hmm. people understood, we were waiting for our two wells that were out of service to, in order to get a baseline for that sub area, that small zone. So now that uh, Main Street well is back in service as well as O'Neill, um, we can get that baseline started and that was done on October 9th. And so starting next Monday, we are gonna begin sampling that zone. And, uh, the, the, the plan is to open the valve on uh, November 26th, if you wanna put something on your calendar. We are still coordinating with the uh, Department, the Division of Drinking Water. Uh, a permit has not been issued, but uh, we do hope in the, certainly by November 26th, we will have that in hand, um, responding to any comments they have. So that's it for the engineering report. Uh, let me see if there are any questions. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, you have mentioned the TCP facility and it's, it's CEQA on hold, coastal permit on hold, design on hold, and I'm wondering is when are we gonna get this going? Because that's not one that's gotten held up. So don't we have to meet TCP regs at some point? Well, yes, mm -hmm. right now. Um, but, you know, we have limited staffing and so we're, we're trying to hit the high priority items. It is a high high priority for uh, O&M because mm -hmm. it is a, a very critical um, source for us. Um, and in this year's budget, we did budget for those three items. Obviously no construction, but mm -hmm. moving forward with some of the paperwork. Um, I think once we get the uh, Granite Way well uh, behind us, then that would potentially be the next project we can check off the list, but there's only so many of us in the office. Yeah. Um, Could we hire consultants to help with the, some of this work? Well, y y yeah, I mean, the coastal permit is probably something we handle in-house. CEQA and design would, uh, would be something we would reach out to consultants anyway. Mm -hmm. um, okay. It's, it, it doesn't mean that there's no work to be done when you hire consultants, so. Mm -hmm. yeah. it, it's definitely on our list. Um, just with the surface water ramping up this this month, um, we don't have we haven't had any time to do that. Okay. Okay. So you're now O and M. O and M. <laughs> yeah, I'll mention that the O'Neill well. I did mention the O'Neill well is back online now that uh, the lower 100 feet of screened perforations are are blocked off. Um, it reduced the specific capacity of that well significantly. I think I reported that uh, at an earlier meeting. Uh, so th we have to be mindful of nearby um, the, the drawdown because of that lowered specific capacity. So we're monitoring that very closely. Uh, significant reduction in uh, flow rates. Uh, that well will be turned off uh, during the transfer as well as the other two wells. That's the whole point, um, we'll have to turn it on to make sure it's available because there's no guarantee that the city won't have to turn off the inner tie. I want to clarify that for everybody that it's and not a guarantee. They may run into some problems and they need to turn off the inner tie. So we need to be prepared to um, go back to wells yep. right away. But the plan is to stay on surface water uh, as much as possible through April and then after that um, go back to the wells and continue the sampling and monitoring plan. Mm -hmm. um, I will mention, I don't believe it's in, in uh, the O&M report, um, but the city is planning to do an ASR test at the Belts 12 and that it overlaps this winter transfer period. So they'll not only be putting in surface water into a Belts 12 uh, as, an in, as an injection or recharge well, um, at the same time as sending water, as us purchasing water from the city uh, and meeting their own demand, that's all gonna happen during the same period. 
the extraction and uh, the third phase of that they want to pump that water back into the 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 recovered water back into their distribution system and we don't want that water coming to the trans to the inner tie right and so we're going to try to coordinate to have that done after april um so that we continue to receive surface water because the whole point is to 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 monitor water quality changes with surface water not groundwater right. so okay. any questions on that not for me okay. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay, let's go on. Yeah, so Melanie, is, yep, Melanie's in the uh, air right now. Um, been invited to speak down at Metropolitan uh, Water District. They have a conference going on down there, so I'll, I'll pinch it for her. Uh, a communication plan has been developed for the water transfer project, uh, and the plan's been submitted to the Division of Drinking Water. For that's for the pilot project. Uh, on October 18th, the uh, first session of the WaterWise Academy will be starting. We have about nine or ten people uh, that are interested in that customer, so that's, that's awesome. Uh, also, on that similar note, this coming Saturday from 12 to 3 at the heart of Soquel Park, there's the Water Harvest Festival, which we're collaborating with a number of agencies. Uh, the environmental review uh, for the EIR Pure Water is going a little faster than anticipated. We got less comments than I think ESA anticipated, so they think that they'll be finished before the end of 2018 or early 2019. And let's see, the district did receive a $150,000 grant reimbursement from the federal government, U.S. Bureau of Reclamation for the uh, feasibility for pure water. So they provided us a grant for that feasibility study and uh, have now wrote, written a check to us. And we're still waiting on further grant monies that, um, that we applied for with the Bureau and we anticipate in, in the next month or two hearing from them. So that's it for special projects and community outreach. Finance, please. So for finance, I just wanted to give you a quick status update on the refunds for the lawsuits. Um, it's a little more laborious than we had first anticipated. It means touching about 20,000 customer accounts manually. Um, so it's taking us a little bit longer than we anticipated, but we are getting it done and we, hope to, we, we anticipate having it done before the end of October. Um, the other thing is the Water Rates Advisory Committee meets on uh, October 29th. And SB 998 was signed into law, and that is um, a, a legal statute that addresses the discontinuation of water services. Under that statute, we will have to wait at least 60 days after they become delinquent before we can shut off water service. That has to, we, that has to be in place by February of 2020. Um, and because we are already making procedural changes under our new Tyler Encode utility billing system that we'll be rolling out probably May or June of next year, we're thinking that we'll just incorporate those procedural changes for SB 998 as part of our Tyler update. So we'll bring you back in the policy on discontinuation of service. Human resources. Okay, switching gears a little bit. <laughs> Um, I did just want to give the board an update on our recruitment. Um, we did have a new employee start today in our customer service field conservation department. We have uh, Denver Grant who came to us from the Glendora Water District as an experienced um, water conservation worker and he'll be working as a customer um, service uh, field uh, representative. Um, so we're happy to have him on board. We closed the um, this position, the board clerk uh, executive assistant position, and we start interviewing this week for that position. So hopefully we'll be getting that position filled. And um, due to an anticipated retirement, um, we did get confirmation of that retirement. So we um, advertised and we have a recruitment running right now for a operations supervisor, which will be vacated at the end of this year. So. Okay, thank you. General manager. Right, and so always keeping an eye on the bigger picture. Two things caught my eye um, this month, and that is uh, Department of Water Resources uh, published their 
water year 2018 recap and I think I took these bullet items directly out of their report, but um, it's referenced there. A hot and dry conditions return is the uh, title for water year 2018. And I'll just run through the bullet items. I think they're um, important. Nearly all the state experienced below average precip precipitation. Much of so Southern California ended up with uh, half or less than the average that they get down there. The water year coincided with ongoing warmer conditions, setting records this summer for maximum temperatures in the South Coast region. Um, the water year 2018 is indicative of California and California's ongoing transition to a warmer climate, which after years of extreme variability and annual precip resulted in record-breaking wildfires. So again, the whole climate thing, you know, maybe at a inflection point even we're seeing a lot go on and then uh, hilly ocean uh, organization that um, I keep on my radar they just uh, they're starting to question why isn't more done with uh, recycled water and so they published a report noting that 417 billion gallons of treated municipal waste is discharged through 57 locations and you know, they wonder why, um, and I'll read here, uh, has no clear benefit to the uh, environment or water supplies, and if it was used aggressively, it could, it could make a dent. That's, the end, and that's how they conclude their report. So I just wanted to share those two items. That's great. Thank you. Okay. Any public comment about the reports? Thank you, Becky Steinbrunner. Uh, thank you, Mr. Dufour, for that great engineering report. I, that's good news. You've got a date, <laughs> November 26th, that the valve's going to open. That's really good news. Thank you, running through April. And um, I had a question um, regarding the O'Neill well. You said it was back online. Is the O'Neill well indeed back online? I want to make sure I heard that correctly. It's been down for a very long time, and I hope it is, and that the ammonia issue is resolved. On page 100 of um, the report, there's some discussion about Aptos Village improvements, and um, I wonder if you can elaborate a little bit about um, the storm drain improvements that may require relocation of water mains in the uh, phase 2A and 2B. What is 2A and 2B? How do they differ? And um, how much might that cost? Um, I think that's, those are my main questions. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Okay, seeing none. We move on to item six point no, item five point five. Can you give us an answer, my question? I don't know the answer. Can you direct Mr. Dufour to answer that? I don't want to, but if he wants to. You can contact him later. Can he may not have the information either. Okay, public out. Outreach Committee summary. The, yeah, so the committee, uh, both that committee and the other committee uh, met. I think we have the summary here. This is meant more for a venue for the board to elaborate. I will say um, one of the things that I thought was nice was the portions of the, I think it's attached here. Let me go here. That's a, oh, yeah, you do it, yeah. Um, they went through uh, some of the website stats and other factors, so you can see that the website's been extremely successful. Um, we're getting much greater hits than the average, I think twice, if I remember correctly, what a typical website. So uh, this is one of the things the board requested last time was, uh, or a year or two ago, uh, public outreach looks good, seems like we're hitting a lot of people, let's try to quantify it, and it's always a challenge course the web uh, helps you do that so that's one venue which we use let's arrow on down let's see what else we got so it just gives you oh, a 30 percent open rate yeah the um, that's that's extremely high um, industry averages around 23 percent so 
we're about a th roughly a third above that good work they're doing. And just when you look at this, you see the kind of work that the district's doing. I mean, the quarterly news uh, letter um, informing our customers that goes out. Of course, the annual water quality report, 12 press releases. That's one one a month. Uh, there are a bunch of ads and banners on the right side there and coming down, collaborating with other agencies for uh, where we can for things that are cross areas, uh, fix a leak. One of my personal favorites, because uh, Vi Campbell and I tried to do this for 10 years, uh, I never got it off the ground. Now Shelly and Melanie and Becca have gotten magnets for the trucks that uh, uh, advertise um, the rebates and that sort of thing. So a really inexpensive yet effective uh, method. And I think Shelly mentioned at the meeting that you've gotten uh, a lot of the rebates are coming through these magnets, so that's a positive thing. And then, of course, the coffee talks, the board and staff making an effort to, to get out in the community to um, reach the public. And so we, um, I think one, at least one other water agency commented that uh, they're taking our almost exact ad and concept here and, and running with it, which is great, because that's one of the things in water, especially, especially conservation and outreach that they capitalize on each other's good work. Is there anything else there to, to add? Oh yeah, so it keeps on going. The educational trailer, which won an award uh, recently in the Learning Center. I, I, I plead with anybody who has not been uh, to the district and gone through the Learning Center, please do that. The board was willing to give up their boardroom uh, and make it into a Learning Center and it's uh, got hands-on things uh, uh, to touch uh, a little game for kids, so give you a minute uh, for your kid to be occupied while you take the tour. That only takes a couple minutes. Small space, but impactful. And social media, of course, is, is important these days and a lot of numbers on that. So uh, just wanted to bring that bring that to the forefront there, the, the outreach. We've really stepped it up to communicate with our customers. Any questions, comments? Seeing none, five five water resources committee. Yeah, it, there's just a summary. I won't uh, necessarily elaborate on on this unless unless there's specific questions. Um, pretty much detailed there what we what we went through. Any questions on this? Comments? Um, well, I just had a I just had a comment on on the minutes because it, it was about the last. Uh, Second to the last bullet on the mm -hmm. Santa Cruz efforts on treated water. Isn't that, it's not for treated water? What's that? Um, go, go, go back. Oh. Oops, go right. back. What, what, where are we at? Oh, Ken right Gerard's at the bottom. At the bottom. Just, uh, yeah, so he, he uh, submitted an email. Ken Gerard is a member of the public. He's a customer that's on the committee as a public advisor. And uh, after the discussion we had at this, he sent an email saying, um, how does, uh, he was unclear and he thought it would be a good agenda item for an upcoming meeting regarding what the city's doing uh, with their ASR, Aquifer Storage and Recovery. So I took that, shared it with the managers, and Taj, probably within four or five minutes, sent a request over to Santa Cruz to attend the next meeting, uh, this, this specific meeting, to have one of their representatives come and, oh, okay. and talk about that. So that's in, in motion. I believe they said, yeah, they would send some, one, of, uh, one of their staff representatives. So that's what that's uh, pertaining to. Okay. And I know they also give tours of their plant, too, if you really wanted to get into it. Right, right. Okay, any questions, comments on that? Mid County Groundwater Agency update. Yeah, so I know we have two board members that are on that. Um, president um, Tom LeHue is the president of that uh, committee right now, and, and uh, Director Daniels, you're on it. Uh, just an, an opening for that. I will just set the stage that uh, it, we're kind of crossing a precipice into less planning and results that are coming out of it, which is refreshing to see. So at the last meeting, there wasn't uh, too much on the agenda. I think a, uh, the biggest item was some more work for uh, Montgomery and Associates, uh, used to be Hydrometrics, 
to do additional work. Um, but the kind of the roll up your sleeves work is being done um, at the groundwater sustainability plan advisory committees uh, that meet monthly as opposed to the MGA, which meets bi-monthly. So at the last GSP advisory committee meeting, um, some of the preliminary modeling results were presented uh, that they have been doing, and we plan on continuing with that at the next uh, meeting. I think the other big thing was the water basin status report, which was on our agenda later. Right, right, you're right. That was uh, also there. It'll be presented later. Any tonight. comments on that? Yeah, I, I have a comment. Okay. So the, the, the groundwater sustainability, sustainability plan advisory committee is starting to get down to uh, the point where we're doing our first iteration at, at the uh, – the metrics that are required in the, in the sustainability plan. And one thing that's being evaluated right now is uh, how to determine what the minimum acceptable groundwater levels are. And uh, so just, you know, if any of the board members or public have any input on that, I'd like to hear it. Well, clearly at the coast, it's the protective groundwater levels right. that we've already determined, or if we use the water uh, model to develop some new numbers, it's those, but. For right now, all we have is the protective levels. Yes. Yeah, if I might add uh, to elaborate on Director Jaffe saying, so in the, the metrics I believe you're referring to are the um, indicators, uh, sustainability indicators, there's six or seven really, and one of them is groundwater levels. And so what we've done, this is an iterative process, but set the lower threshold, the minimum acceptable number. And so now they're going back, yeah, that's, that's the, the lowest floor, so to speak. But what do we really want to obtain as a, uh, as a community? What are the levels we're we shooting for? Not what's just barely acceptable. So um, you have your high goal or your goal, and then you have the minimal. And we're we're on to the high goal now, or the goal, and we'll iterate back through. Okay. Any, I guess I just on that. I guess once again that might come down to a little bit more modeling, right? Because like if you model like worse drought and you had protective levels, then how long would that be protective for? Because you want you would like to have a margin of yes. safety. Yep. But I don't. I don't know whether that's based yeah, on the yeah, um, it, it, it definitely more iterations of the model. For example, what they did at the last, um, the model results they presented last time, um, my interpretation of what uh, they were saying, and it was done in a, a different way, but they said, what's the basin need? And um, they, so they just assumed we cut back our pumping X amount. And so that looked like, I think they cut us back a couple scenarios, 13 or 1400 acre feet, and then assumed we got a couple hundred acre feet from the city of Santa Cruz. So it was roughly mm -hmm. a 1500 acre foot deficit is the way I interpreted it. But that uh, they said, oh, and they may be able to improve that if they optimize, if we can optimize pumping a little bit more. But the but is that that still didn't uh, heal down in the aromas and then over toward the Santa Cruz area, what we call the TU, the lower aquifer near the granitic base with the sediments, also is experiencing um, some significant uh, drawdown. So you might be able to take care of part of the middle of the basin with that amount of cutback and with the two edges, so we'll have to solve that portion of the riddle, riddle too. Any other comments on that? None? Uh, Mr. It's a hand raised. Oh, okay. Come on up. Uh, I want to be clear that you were talking with Mr. Jaffe. No. Who you were talking with. Mm -hmm. um, Thank you, Becky Steinbrenner. I, um, I just would like to point out that the summary of the committee meetings do, do reflect that members of the public were there, but reflect nothing of public comment at those meetings. And I think there should be some notation on the, the minutes or the committee summaries that. Um, the nature of the comments that the public did uh, did submit. So I, I would like that. Um, I would also like to see that uh, in future 
committee meetings and actually board meetings too, there be a declaration of ex parte communication. I think that lends itself well to transparency. And in addition to uh, the c uh, report about the Mid-County Groundwater Agency update, there is, I believe, a tour coming up next week on October 23rd uh, for the GSP members and also members of the public that are interested in touring some of these monitoring wells and maybe you have more information. I know that it is going to happen, but um, I think that would be, I would appreciate you putting that out to the public here at this meeting tonight. So maybe those at home listening could uh, and would be interested in going could sign up. Thank you very much. Yeah, I don't know the, the times on that. I, I'm not involved with that personally. I know that uh, outreach is handling that. It's, it's do you know the, the date? I, yeah. uh, I, I know it's in our, our report that we just mailed to everyone. Um, our oh, the blast from the MGA? Yeah. It's mm -hmm. Tuesday. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a setup to visit different sites um, along the, you know, the creeks, one monitoring well, well, that sort of thing. Well, here it is on October 23rd. Did, but you knew that already, didn't you? Uh, are you interested in the Mid-County Groundwater Basin and want to learn more? You are invited to join our GSP Advisory Committee on a Groundwater Basin Tour. We will visit a monitoring well, production wells, a drinking water storage tank, a stream gauge, and a few locations on Soquel Creek. We will meet staff from agencies that work together in this region to help uh, protect habitat values and improve water supply reliability. So that is... Uh, the basic description of it, it sounds interesting. Um, is that on our website, Director Christensen? Are you reading? Um, no, I'm reading on a mailer. Oh, mailer, So okay. 9 o'clock, meet at Coastal Monitoring, monitoring Well. We'll have oral argument. So we won't have a decision on that case until 90 days after the oral argument. So my guess is probably not before the end of the year. Mm -hmm. uh, Great Oaks is sitting in limbo in San Jose. Nobody seems to know what's going on. I'm still talking to Bob Johnson, who's one of the attorneys about it. And one of the bills that didn't get a lot of attention is SB 1244, which was adopted and it actually
and completed all the water demand offset uh, requirements. They replaced 35 low flow toilets, mm -hmm. installed 35 low flow toilets. Mm -hmm. They're ready for your consideration. Okay. Any public comment? Any public comment on that? None? Back? Okay. I'm going to move approval. And I'll second it. We have a motion second. Roll call, please. Director LaHue. Yes. Director Christensen. Yes. Director Jaffe. Yes. President Daniels. No. So that passes. So uh, let's see, we go on to 6.2, new ordinance. So item 6.2 is the second reading of ordinance 1802, um, superseding ordinance 1801, fixing rates, charges, and fees. And this is just kind of bringing us back full circle to wrap up all of the rate changes that were a result of the lawsuit settlement. Um, so this is just the final reading and adoption of that ordinance. Okay. Any public comment? I'll make, I'll make the motion. Uh, hold on, we have public comment. Oh, sorry. No problem, you couldn't see it. <laughs> for the, Becky Steinbruner, for the public's benefit, can you please review um, the necessity for uh, 1802. Didn't specify particularly fire services, and that was determined at a later time, and so 1802. Any questions? Nope, I'll make the motion. I'll second the motion. Roll call, please. Director LaHue? Yes. Director Christensen? Yes. Director Jaffe? Yes. And President Daniels? Yes. Okay, and now we go to the aforementioned Santa Cruz Mid County Basin Groundwater Monitoring Update. Great, yes, yeah, so this was presented uh, to the MGA, the Mid-County Groundwater, um, at their last meeting. Actually, it was on the consent agenda, so it wasn't presented, it was just in there as an informational item. So knowing we're kind of the heart of the basin um, and our board's background. state of critical overdraft and that's uh, you can see it uh, up there on the screen their exact words are therefore the basin continues to be in a state of overdraft um, uh, it does suggest that uh, seawater intrusion uh, is not particularly increasing at this time although because of the water levels coming up although we just had uh, a gentleman walk in our door a couple months ago where his well just got hit so the uh, with seawater intrusion. So uh, Basin's doing better, we're not there yet. So, you know, what I don't want, what I want people to be acknowledged in my mind is that, hey, all the great work that our customers have done in this stage three curtailment has made a difference. And they're cutting back approximately 25% over the last couple of years and the good work that Taj and his team have done redistributing the pumping. I can't under over uh, overemphasize that enough because it's crucial in the in the mix. The lower demand on the basin by our customers during our uh, stage three curtailment um, 
has lowered usage and given us a little bit more breathing space in how we operate our wells, basically reducing um, pumping at the coast and also the EIR we did a couple of years ago for the five wells to move that the board approved that to move some of the wells in, uh, such as Granite Way, what are a couple of the other wells, Polo and O'Neill would be three of those wells. So that, that's made a difference. So, however, the what what I'm concerned about uh, is the bounce back or potential rebound from this uh, huge conservation effort that uh, our customers have been uh, doing. So, you know, the two we ha we found two good pieces of data. Uh, one is a Stanford report, and actually that does a good analysis, but it doesn't really reach a conclusion. They say it's very complex how rebound occurs and. They haven't nailed it yet. However, there's another graph, and it's cited in that uh, upper diagram. I'm going to pull it up since it's not in the uh, report. It's just linked. And that's this chart. And this is, a, this is a very revealing chart in my mind. This is from Water Deeply. And I'll just slowly walk you through it. Uh, this is a graph. Uh, you got years along and months along the bottom there on the x-axis. And on the left y axis is percentage of adults, and on the right y-axis is uh, water savings. And percentage of adults on the left is, uh, that's of awareness or think that the water supply is a big issue. So what you see here is when the water supply was high in people's minds, around 65, 70 percent as being a big issue, um, and that was due to the kind of universal wide, statewide press of the drought and everything, uh, uh, conservation spiked. It went way up. It went from just a couple percent up to around thir 25, 30 uh, percent. However, as the state started to say, hey, it, uh, the drought is now over, you um, and not making such a big deal of it in the press, the consumption also declined almost in line with it. So I guess my point is that at some point we hope to lift the stage three curtailment. That's part of the uh, effort behind the community water plan to get supplemental supplies so prevent seawater intrusion and, and not make it so arduous on our customers. But in my mind, this graph suggests that once we do that, we'll probably see something similar to what we're seeing here. And we've already seen, when you look at our reports, what we're seeing is a steady incremental increase already in usage, especially in the summer months, but some in the indoor also. So uh, reason to, to, to be proud of our customers, uh, they've they've towed the line this far, uh, and the, and the request and the call to conserve, um, and I think that has staved off uh, further seawater intrusion. However, there'll probably come a time uh, that uh, the, you know I know they want to re and uh, go back to normal usage, and when they uh, are told that it's okay to do so, um, you'll probably see it the consumption rebound uh, uh, in accordance to this. I mean, it already has. It already has rebounded. It has not as bad as the rest of the state, but um, it has. But I think I think that's a lot to our messaging. I mean, we're yeah. we're out there. If you look at every newsletter, every it always. I mean, right. don't give up. Don't give up. Thank you. You're 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 holding us till we can get a supplemental supply. Um, uh, you know, I know I don't know of any agency that that messages as, as strong as we do on the conservation side of things because we need to. I would like to comment on uh, page 158, if you could bring that up. Oops. 158. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I have to read. Yep. So the interesting part about this, um, A4, which is off the screen at the bottom, there's A4. Um, a4 is a foot and a half off of protective levels. A3 is also off protective levels, but not by much, uh, two tenths 
approximately. And uh, A8 is also off of protective levels, about a foot. Kind of interesting that, you know, all three of there are not protective except A2 is in the middle. So I'm not quite sure why that would be the case, that A2 is pretty good and the other three are not. If you go over to Soquel Point, it is still also not at protective levels. That's, of course, in the city of Santa Cruz's Live Oak area. So that's one of their wells. There's saltwater intrusion there. And the other thing is A5, 5A, right up there in the kind of Aptos area. And uh, that's kind of a dangerous place because uh, well, there's that big pumping depression inland from there. So they're off a foot and a half. So that's worrisome. Yeah, can, can I comment on that? Sure. Because, uh, you know, when I get this information, I go back and look at our old, uh, you know, where we were uh, just, I think it was 2012, um, it was 70 feet below sea level there. And knowing that if was we- inland. In, inland, in, inland. Inland, right. 70, the groundwater levels were 70 feet below sea level inland at our pumping well and basically sucking in seawater uh, in the aquifer. Uh, I've, I, in my, and the hydrologist did uh, some uh, estimates, we've published those I, in previous documents, but that if we continued that, we would have, uh, uh, it would hit our main well field in two years. And so, you know, now we have the sky tim data showing that it is right at the coast so if we had continued that, we uh, uh, hadn't reduced our pumping, moved our pumping inland, then my conclusion based on their analytics is that well fill would be hit right now. And there are five production wells. Yeah, it's our heart of our production for yeah. sure. So it's still not out of the woods though because no. we're not at protective levels. So that's the biggest thing I carried away from the study. Any public comment? I have a comment. Oh, first. sure. Go ahead. Uh, so these protected levels, uh, the numbers that are reported are some type of average uh, in terms of where the groundwater level is relative to the protected level. And if you look at, for instance, SC3A, <coughs> which is uh, on the page 166 of the agenda, <laughs> Even though the average is above the protective level, there are times of year where it's the, the water levels are below protective. So that does not give me a good feeling at all. That because assuming that the protective level is the, uh, the right level, uh, whenever you go below that, whether it's an average or whether it's just for a short period of time, seawater will be coming in. That's a good point. One other... So, oh, go ahead. That just, so it's, it, even with using averages, it's five of the 13 coastal monitoring wells are below protective levels. And the numbers I was giving out was the offset from the 12-month average. There's also a, a three-month average. Because mm -hmm. this was done in the spring, the yeah three month is a lot better than the 12 month. Yeah. The other thing is remember when we came up with those protective levels, we debated, we decided on a 70% confidence level or, you know. Yeah. So, I mean, if you, if you just want to increase that confidence level a little bit, that makes them higher. And I wonder if, you know, just, just to remind, remind myself and us of that. Yeah. Right. But, you know, if I may comment, that's a great point that Director Jaffe makes. Uh, this is not a game of averages here. I'm a, I, I am a, an average, I, I, I do the average, that's my kind of mantra, but in these kind of things, because I think it pans out in the long run, but in this kind of scenario, uh, just like episodic stream and erosion, it doesn't happen as an average, you know, and when you do get a dip and it is below a protective level, it's, it is pulling the uh, seawater intrusion in there, so you cannot go by the averages on this. It's a really good All point. True. Any other? Okay. Thank you, Becky Steinbrenner. First of all, I want to point out that 
this data is um, only up until January 1st, 2015. So um, I would like to see some more current data. But I, I think in looking through this, what really amazes me is that um, the, the aquifer appears to be very resilient and responsive to conservation because leading up to 2015, that was a drought time and uh, people really did a great job conserving. But even that the 2000 data goes to 2018, just, just Well, so that's you know. not what I'm seeing on the graph. Okay, well, that's the last labeled point is January 2015, but there's three bars after that, which would take you to 2018. Table one demonstrates it up on the screen, March. Oh, well, on the graphs, that's not labeled at oh. all. Well, that's because every five years is labeled? Uh-huh, okay. Okay. Well, so that's not clear. Well, well, all right. Well, thank you. Well, then that's even better. <laughs> so because, th again, it shows... These are spring m numbers, which are best case numbers. I'm sorry? These are spring numbers? Yeah. Which means they're the best case. It's after so a, a year, a, rain, a, a season of rainfall. Okay. Thank you. So to me, that even reinforces the resiliency of, of the aquifer. And um, what I see overall is that the groundwater levels have come up. Um, and what I see in most cases is that the chloride and total dissolved solids have gone down or stabilized. And I think that's very good. Even at uh, the Moran Lake uh, thing on page 162, 166. Uh, number 3A, the groundwater level is up. 167, 5A, uh, the chloride is, is down or stable. Groundwater elevations up. Uh, 168, uh, 9C, the groundwater level is up. 169, 8B, it's up. One pa page 170, uh, 1A, the groundwater level up. And 176, 3A, the groundwater level is up. So. That is all good news. At what point does the district um, decide that you can remove the, I, I believe in your t tier, your fee structure, you charge an emergency water rate. So at what point do you correlate this information with how you're going to be charging your customers and, um, and maybe uh, adjust some of the urgency of the, Pure Water SoCal plan to give the water transfer program a bit of a chance. Thank you. We look at all the numbers. Can, can I make a comment? Um, okay. Yeah, you know, one of the things that can be misinterpreted uh, is the dynamic nature of the uh, aquifer. And w uh, what I think is being realized is that the aquifer is more responsive than what the hydrologist originally intended. And so what goes up fast goes down very fast. So what it's I suggesting to us is that a, um, you, any temporary hit on the aquifer, whether it's pooling or, or drought, would cause the numbers to go down quickly. And so this is actually makes us more concerned uh, as we approach it. Uh, not less concern. So uh, I think it's important to, to note that. You know, the aquifer actually is extremely responsive. To give you an idea, we used to measure water levels essentially by putting a stick down and seeing where the water was located in the well. We did that every month or two or quarter or whatever. And now we put electronic meters in. And when we did that, we found out water levels were going up and down every day along with the tide. So it would go up and down, it would go up twice a day and down and up and down and up just from the title. So it's a very responsive thing. It's a system. Okay, let's move on. I have a, co I have a comment. Okay. And I, I'm, I'm glad people like Becky are taking a close look at this. Uh, but for instance, on page 166, there's a five-year trend line and where it shows the, the levels going up, but if you look at the last three years of it, they're pretty stable. So I think it's a misrepresentation that all these water levels are going up. Uh, so 
just want to uh, make that comment to be careful in interpreting the data and, and not to just look at a five-year trend. Yep, quite true. Anything else? Okay, so we move on. Item 6.4, Granite Way well site improvements. Thank you. As I reported earlier in my status report, we had to bisect this project to hopefully um, save the district some money and our ratepayers some money. Um, last month we received, we had this project out to bid as a combined project and we received only one bid and it was uh, $276,000 over our, our budget, our estimate. Um, so there's a couple items, big ticket items that staff can handle kind of independently and individually and so this is this item it will include installing the well pump uh, the column pipe that brings the water up from the pump and the discharge head as well as the concrete pedestal and and also the wire that goes to the pump or the pump to the submersible motor um, after that we will it'll sit it'll be sealed and protected and then we'll hopefully uh, order, that's this contract, and that's the only, th only scope of work for this. Um, separately, we'll bring the electrical cabinets and then some of the other work that we need to do, but this is just to get the ball rolling. We, we did solicit two proposals. We tried to get more, but um, these both were significantly less than what was itemized in the big, the, the lump sum bid in September. So. Staff feels confident. We've worked with both of these contractors before. We're, we're comfortable working with Precision Hydro. It's actually a sister company of the company that drilled the well for the district. So uh, it is our recommendation to award this bid to Precision Hydro, and we'll move forward with ordering the equipment and installing this part of the project. Okay, any questions? Did it? Hi. Go ahead. Just so, so it was significantly less than the bid that came in, and how did it compare with the engineer's estimate? This is in line with what we've okay. seen. We would have expected, okay. absolutely. Mr. Jaffe? That, that was my same question. Okay. And Taj, thank, thank you for the creative approach to this, to finding a way to get this work done for less money. Thank you. Any public comment? Thank you, Becky Steinbrunner. Um, I, I was interested to see the Pacific Coast well drilling um, bid on this. I do remember there was some legal dispute um, after the initial drilling, and I just want to verify that you that the district is confident that they will do a good job, that there won't be any further legal um, action that would bring expense to the ratepayers and cause delays to the, the work. And um, just in, in closing, uh, having just, we've all just examined the, the groundwater modeling, it still baffles me that this new well is being drilled in the Aptos Village project instead of up further inland at the quail run tank um, where maybe the soils might have even been better than the clay soils at Aptos Village. Thank you. Anyone else? Just yeah. so I don't, maybe Mr. DeFore does, I don't remember any legal issues arising out of the drilling of that well with, with the well driller. Was there? No. No, I, there weren't any. I don't know what that <laughs> comment came from. I don't either, because I mean, the, uh, the idea that our engineering manager would even bring something if he had a concern about that <laughs> kind of ticks me off. Right. And all these well locations were ones that were picked by our hydrologists after careful examination of the entire district and where would be the best place. And all of them went through an EIR, and uh, right. that's why it's there. In fact, if we picked another place, we'd have to go off and spend a pile of money to do another EIR, because we, we don't have right. approval to put it anywhere else. So it looks like there are four um, motions to be made. I will make those. I will second. Roll call, please. 
Director LaHue. Uh, yes. Uh, Director Christensen. Yes. Director Jaffe. Yes. And President Daniels. Yes. Okay. So that passes. Thank you. And just for clarification, you passed all four motions as right. written. That's correct. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have two letters. If they kind of stand up, say what they say. So, any comment on those? Any action on those? Public comment? Um, as the writer of one of those two letters, it, I copied you on my. Um, comment on the Twin Lakes Church Pilot Recharge Project. Did the district extend the public comment for that project? I don't believe so. For the pilot recharge well? State no. law. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Okay. Well, I would just, as I said in my comment, like to point out that the, um, the environmental study for it was really um, done as just a, a a standalone project, not really linking it at all to what its true purpose is, and that's an injunction, injection well for the Pillwater SoCal project. And I really, um, I really think that needs to be examined. That's considered in the other EIR. What about all the trees that will be removed with this? That wasn't considered in the EIR. That wasn't there. No, it's considered here. So um, the other issue that I have with this project is that from the public's thoroughfare on Cabrillo College Drive, there is no notice at all. You have to go up into the church property and you have to park in their private parking lot to see a, a small laminated piece of paper. And so I really um, feel that this project has not had adequate noticing not visibly public in on Cabrillo College Drive. And um, again, it was not on your district website immediately with if people went to the website. I, I did that and I came to you before and pointed it out. So um, again, I really feel like this project has not received thorough public noticing and um, I know you're going to move forward with it because that's what you've got on your mind, but I just want to protest it. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else? Seeing none, I think we're done with all the written communications and correspondence. And so we now go to closed session. There are two items uh, for discussion. If there's any public comment on those. Yes, I do, Becky Steinbrunner. And again, I want to point out that uh, without even having adopted this project, obviously the um, property acquisition at 2505 Chanticleer Avenue, the land property is for Pure Water SoCal project, as is the property at 2701 Cabrillo College Drive from the Twin Lakes uh, Church. And it, it irritates me that this very expensive these very expensive transactions are moving forward without the completion of your EIR, without the board um, formally approving and adopting it as a project that you're willing to take on, and without any vote at all from your ratepayers or the other users, other people who depend on this pure Purisima aquifer for our water. And I think it's, um, it's very irritating. And I just, again, want to protest that your board, I think, is not being transparent. And the ratepayers have no idea what is going on. As Mr. Canizero told you, most people are not in favor of this. Most people have no idea that they're looking at another rate increase in March and one every year after that for five years. That's what your plans have said, to pay for this project. And yes, you are applying for grants, and yes, I'm happy to hear that you're getting some, 
but it's still these these grants the 70 million dollar grants anyway are reimbursement grants and some of them will take possibly 10 years to get reimbursement so you're putting a huge debt burden on your ratepayers and I really want to point out that there are no safe drinking water standards for many of the pharmaceuticals, NDMA, and other unknown contaminants that cannot even be tested for because sewage is a chemical soup. And you can't test for what you don't know is there. That's been put out in many local sources. And you're rolling your eyes, Director LeHue. That's all right. You do that. But I'm still protesting, and I'm not alone. There's a, there's a groundswell of people out there who are not at all happy with both the expense and the health risk of this project. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you for your comments. I, I did not agree with them at all. Right. That I wasn't rolling my eyes. I just closed my eyes because I've heard this a lot of times. And like I said, the science behind it what actually water that's been purified compared with pretty much any other source is going to be a better quality, so. Marilyn Garrett, 37-year uh, resident of Aptos. I do agree with Becky Steinbrunner's comments and uh, think we're reading different science and sewage It's related water. to her letter? And that's the comments right now. Yes, and um, sewage water is a chemical soup. What the rate payers are facing here without being informed, without their consent, I think is improper, and the fact that you're moving ahead without the EIR being completed seems uh, backwards in the procedural steps that need to take place. Um, I also understand by, um, let's see, Twin Lakes that to do this project, many oak trees will be cut down. I'm very much against cutting trees. And speaking of cutting trees, uh, related to that, pg e is doing massive cutting of trees in the county. That that's not, that's not. No, no, but the, the groundwater, this is going to affect the water levels and quality everywhere, and I think that's key that we need to look at always. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, we are done. We go to closed session. I'll just mention one thing is just that the cost when it was analyzed of water, if we don't have any kind of supplemental supply, ends up being um, more, much more per unit of water. 